So in this next lesson, we're going to start off with what they call risk assessment as a theme. And we're going to look at some things that are pretty pertinent to us. Um, and we're going to start with um, texting distance. So it says many cities and states have banned texting while driving because it's dangerous. Um, many people think that texting for just a few seconds isn't harmful. And so what we're going to do is we're going to calculate um, if we're driving 45 miles an hour and you take your eyes off to answer a text and say it takes you four seconds to answer the text, we're going to determine how far you think or how far that your car will travel during that time. So the first thing they ask is to predict the number of feet your car will travel during that time. So um, if you think of a, a classroom, like a typical classroom is, is often about 30 feet. So think to yourself, you know, how big is a classroom? How far do you think your, your car would travel during those four seconds? Do you think it would travel halfway across the classroom, the whole classroom, two classrooms, three classrooms? How far do you think it would go? And honestly, write down a number because it makes it a lot more interesting when you can um, see how your perception compares to the, the actuality. So think about how far do you think it would actually go? Do you think it'd be half of a classroom, 15 feet, a full classroom, 30 feet? couple classrooms, you know, which would be 50 or 60 feet, how far do you think it would go? Um, I often in um, classes get an estimate of about 25 feet as a common um, estimate, and I usually get anywhere from there up to about 100 feet as far as estimates. Um, some people will guess high, uh, lower or higher than that, but it's usually the guesses are somewhere between there. Um, but again, you had in mind what you thought before I wrote this down. So what did you think? And so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, our prediction by actually calculating this. So it says to check your prediction, begin by setting up the units that are needed to convert miles per hour to feet per second. Um, there's a resource in the back of your materials called dimensional analysis. Those resources are listed alphabetically. So if you want to look it up, you'd look for, you'd look up until you get to D. And then, um, but I'm not crazy about the way that they do it in our materials. Um, I like to do dimensional analysis a little bit differently. I mean, it's the same idea, but I don't like leaving the numbers out. I think that's hard to follow. And so I'm going to start with, if we're going um, 45 miles per one hour. That's what 45 miles per hour means, that in one hour you travel 45 miles. And our goal is that we want to figure out how many feet per second that is. And so I usually will write it down just like this. I'll write down 45 miles per hour where we're starting. I'll leave a space because this is where I'm going to do my dimensional analysis and calculate things. And then I write down um, what I'm trying to get to. And I'm going to back this up a little bit and give myself a little bit more room than I have. So I've got my 45 miles per hour, and then I'm going to put over here that we're trying to get to feet per second. So how does this dimensional analysis work? Well, what we want to do is we want to change the miles to feet, and we want to change the hours to seconds. Um, there's other ways to do this, but this is the easiest way, I think, to keep track of it, um, is this dimensional analysis. And what we're going to do is we're going to multiply, and as we multiply, we're going to convert units. So anything that we put in here, we want to be true, okay? So anything that we put in here, we want to be a true equivalent. So for instance, I'm going to pick one of these, and it doesn't really matter which one I start with. I'm going to start with the miles, and I'm going to try to get the miles to feet, because that's only one. Actually, let's start with the hours to seconds, because that's two steps. So I'm going to try to convert my hours to seconds first. And what I'm going to do is I need, since I have hours here on the bottom, I need hours here on the top. That way, these units can cancel out. But what I put here has to be a true equivalent. So I need to put one hour. And if this was five hours or whatever, that wouldn't matter. I would still put one hour here. And I'm trying to get to seconds, so I'm going to try to get closer. Well, closer from hours to seconds would be to get it to minutes. 
So I'm going to say one hour is 60 minutes. This is a true equivalent. One hour and 60 minutes are exactly the same thing. So multiplying by one hour over 60 minutes doesn't change the value of anything. It's like a one, but it would change the units because what's going to happen is the hours are going to cancel. Let me do that with a different color. Are going to cancel with the hours. So this hour is going to cancel with this hour. Um, and so then I'm going to keep going until I have a until I'm to seconds and I'm not to seconds yet I'm only to minutes so I don't want to stop yet with the time I want to keep going until I've gotten to seconds so now I need a true equivalent here that has seconds in it and minutes but I want something that's true so I need to cancel which means the minutes have to go on top here and then um, on the bottom, I'm going to have seconds. So I need something that's true comparing minutes to seconds. Well, that's that one minute is 60 seconds. This has to be a true equivalent. One minute and 60 seconds are exactly the same thing. So this is really just multiplying by one. But now what I can do is I can cancel the minutes on the bottom here with the minutes on the top here. And so now my unit is 60 seconds. Don't worry about the numbers right now, but I'm sorry, my unit is seconds. And so I've gotten down to seconds, which is my goal. So I can stop now with the time. Now I need to go and take care of the miles to feet. Well, I know from prior lessons that what the conversion between miles and feet is. So the question is, where am I gonna put miles? Well, miles has to go on the bottom because it has to cancel all the way over here with this miles, which is on the top. And so we need a true equivalent for feet to miles. So, um, don't really need an S on the end of that. Uh, how many feet are in one mile? And we know from past lessons that that's 5,280. You can always look it up if you forget it. I'll put it on a test if you need it. So 5,280 feet in one mile. Let's grab another color here. Um, black. So this miles here cancels with this miles here, even though they're far apart. One's on top, one's on the bottom, so I can cancel it. And now my units that I have are um, feet right here and seconds. That's the only units I have left, which is what I want, feet and seconds. And I'm just going to multiply here. So 1 times 1 times 5,280 is 5,280. So the top, the only thing that's left besides 1 is the 5,280, so I'll write that here. On the bottom then, I'm going to take, oh I messed that up. Let me back up. I forgot the 45. So forget what I just said. Let's try that again. I like to leave my errors on here sometimes just so that you know that, you know, not everybody's perfect, nobody's perfect, and some of the mistakes that are made. So we want to take 45 times 1 times 1 times 5,280. I forgot the 45 on the first one. So 45 times 1 times 1, of course, is still 45. Then take that times 5,280, and I actually get uh, 237,000. Uh, 600 here on top. Now I know that's a huge number and we're going to fix that in just a minute. Then on the bottom we have 1 times 60 times 60 times 1 which gives us 3600. Now this is true and this is we've got our unit switched now but 237,600 feet in 3700 seconds isn't really very useful. So we're going to switch this we're going to divide the top number by the bottom number so 237,600 and we're going to divide that by 3,600. And that will give us how many feet there are in one second. So uh, that 237,600, divide that by 3,600, and you get 66. 
So believe it or not, in one second, only going, remember, we're only going 45 miles an hour. That's not, um, that's not the speed you would even drive in Houston on a feeder road. Uh, I know the speed limit is around that, but people usually typically drive a little bit faster than that. And then when you get up on the interstate, you're driving, you know, 70 miles an hour typically. So 45 miles an hour would be maybe like a parkway or a throughway. Um, so we're not talking about being out on the interstate. And in one second, you travel 66 feet. That's the length of a couple of classrooms, if you want to think about that visually. And we're not talking about a one-second text. We're talking about um, a four-second text. So we're down here. I kind of skipped this one because I don't like, didn't like this. Um, so we placed our numbers in our setup, and we figured out speed in feet per second, which was the 66 feet per second. So in four seconds, we're going to multiply that. Um, if we're going 66 feet in one second, then um, 66 times 4 is uh, 264 feet. So we would go, this would be equivalent to 264 feet in four seconds. So with a four second text, you're traveling 264 feet. Like we said, this is a couple classrooms. So this is like the length of eight classrooms. That's like all the way down the hallway um, in a school that you travel in four seconds of texting only going 45 miles an hour. That's always surprising to people. Like I said, the biggest guess I usually get is 100. Sometimes people will say 500 or something like that, but this is typically what I'll get. And yet, in four seconds, we're actually going 264 feet. So now it says, you're saying to yourself, I'm sure, oh, my texts don't take me four seconds. They only take me a couple seconds. Well, let's, let's compare that. If you are going um, only for two seconds, of course, that's going to be half the distance. Well, that's 132 feet in two seconds. That's about four classroom lengths. And if you take longer and you go six seconds, then we'd have to add these two together, four seconds and two seconds. There's different ways, again, to do this, but that's a, a quick way since we have the numbers here. That would be 396 feet per second. So that'd be the length of about 12 classrooms. Um, anyway, just uh, food for thought and some good math to do. And I am going to go back and look at this because they ask you to do it in your homework a little bit. But it did ask us to look at this and decide if they set it up correctly. So this is not set up correctly because you'll notice they have miles and miles both on top. This should be switched. And then they have minutes and minutes both on top. So this should be switched. So there's several things wrong with this. Um, so it should be miles per hour. And then here we should do hours per minute, which is what we did up here. We did one hour, 60 minutes. And then it should be seconds to minutes. Whoops, I take that back. Minutes should be on top. So this should be still have the minutes on top. So this should be minutes to seconds so that the hours can cancel and the minutes can cancel. And then um, the next one should be, like we noted here, the miles should be on the bottom because it's on the top over here. And then we would finally get to our feet per second because the miles would cancel with the miles and we'd have feet per second. But again, this very much bothers me not having the numbers in here. So. Um, Maybe it does you too, maybe it doesn't, maybe you like this, uh, but I like to just go ahead and do it with the numbers in it because it helps me keep track of it better than just having the, the names of the units. So we're going to return to this theme of personal finance, and we're going to be talking about uh, Jenna, who has a job that requires her to travel, and she has the option that she can either drive her own Toyota 4Runner or she can rent a car. Either way, her employer doesn't really care. They're just going to reimburse her for mileage. So Jenna's 
decision is basically what would be best her best interest which should she rent a car or should she get reimbursed or I'm sorry or should she uh, use her own car and so what do we need to know to calculate the cost of Jenna's of Jenna driving her own car well first of all we need to know how far she's going okay so we need to know the distance and then we need to know um, her miles per gallon what is her gas mileage on her car so we need to know how many miles per gallon and the distance and then lastly we also need to know the cost of gas so what is the price of gas at this point in time so we need to know how far she's going what gas costs and the miles per gallon um, that her car gets what do we need to know for renting well we still need to know all these same things uh, we need to know the distance we need to know the miles per gallon of the rental car and we need to know the cost of gas but we also need to know the cost of the rental so all the same things about that vehicle except in addition how much it costs to rent it so now Jenna's forerunner is expected to get 22 miles per gallon on the highway or she can rent a, a Hyundai Elantra which gets 40 miles per gallon uh, she's gonna drive 150 miles and gas is 359 a gallon you can tell this was written a few years ago when gas prices were high um, thank goodness they're down a little bit more than that uh, however then that affects the oil industry so it's all all relative so uh, use your estimation skills to estimate which ve vehicle would cost more in gas about how much more well this says to just estimate okay so we're not going to calculate quite yet but the Elantra gets nearly twice as many miles per gallon so it's going to cost roughly half the cost to drive the forerunner as to drive the forerunner so the Elantra is going to cost about half of the cost in gas as the forerunner because it gets t almost twice as many miles per gallon um so the Elantra uh, let's just say Hyundai actually it'll be easier so the Hyundai is about half the cost because almost twice as good of gas mileage or MPG miles per gallon okay so what's the actual cost of the gas for each vehicle um, and it says explain your strategy we're just gonna show our work to explain our strategy so um, if they're gonna if she's gonna drive 150 miles let's do her vehicle first and her car gets 22 miles to the gallon well we need to know how many 22s there are in 150 so we can know how many gallons she's gonna need so 150 divided by 22 uh, gets us roughly about 6.8 gallons that are needed for her vehicle so again every 22 miles she needs a gallon there's 6.8 of those in 150 so she needs 6.8 gallons to make the trip well if we take 6.8 gallons and we multiply it by the cost Per gallon which is 359 then we get her cost to be roughly 6.8 times 359 is about $24 and 41 cents I'm not gonna round one up because there was a two after it so I'm gonna round to the nearest penny but that would be $24 and 41 cents so that's for her car so now let's look at the Elantra I'm gonna do this in a different color so we can kind of keep track um, so for the Elantra uh, we're still gonna go 150 miles on the trip but this vehicle gets 40 miles per gallon so we're gonna divide that by 40 and 150 divided by 40 means that we only need three dollar or three point seven five gallons if we're driving that vehicle so if we take three point seven five gallons and we multiply it by the cost of three fifty nine per gallon 
we get a cost for the Hyundai of $13.46. This goes out, this on the calculator is 0.4625, but because there's a 2 after the 6, I'm not going to round it up. So we've got $24.41 for gas in the Forerunner, and then we've got uh, $13.46 is, is the gas for the Hyundai. What is the total cost of the Elantra rental if the rental is, or of the Elantra, if the rental is $98.98 .98 plus 15.3% tax, gas not included, and it has to be returned with the full tank. So this is not including gas. So in addition to that $13.47, we have to add $98.98 plus 15.3% tax, which is going to be almost $15 because this is almost 100. So let's calculate what that is. 9888 times 0 0.153. 9888 times 0 0.153 is an additional. Um, $15.12, actually 13 if you round it up because there's a, it's 2.8. Uh, then we get a cost of, there's that 13.46 already, plus that we had in gas, so the gas plus the rental plus the tax. So we're at 13.46 plus 98.98, 98, and you can tell already this is going to be way more than take more than taking your own car. But we'll finish it up. Um, that's going to cost her $127.57. And so definitely, if her car is only going to cost her. $24.41 for gas and getting a rental is going to cost $127.57 up front, it definitely looks that her car is a much better deal. Uh, doesn't matter how much they reimburse her because either way she's going to get the same reimbursement for 150 miles no matter which one she drives. So the fact that this one is more is all that really matters. We're going to actually calculate this, though, even though it really doesn't matter as far as which one's better. So it says that they're going to um, give her 56.5 uh, cents per mile. Be careful with this. This can be a little bit deceiving. 56.5 cents per mile is 0 0.565 because this is cents per mile, not dollars. So 56 cents would be 0.56, 56.5 cents would be 0.565. So um, how much is she going to get back from her employer? Well, if we take that times the 150 miles that she's going to drive, 0.565 times 150 is um, $84.75. So she's going to get back $84.75. So if we take for the for her car, she's going to get $84.75, but she's going to spend $24.41. Then what is she going to get at the end? $84.75 minus $24.41. She would actually gain uh, sixty dollars and thirty-four cents. So she would spend that money on her gas, but she's going to get back eighty-four seventy-five. So she's actually going to have a gain of sixty dollars from driving her car. Um, so now let's look at the um, the Elantra, the Hyundai. So she had $84.75 that she's going to get back, but she's going to spend, uh, what was our total down here? $127.57. So she doesn't have a gain with the Elantra. She actually, if you, $84.75 minus $127.57, she actually is going to spend 
4284 because this comes out to be a negative. I'm sorry, it's not 84, it's 82. So she's going to spend $42.82 of her own money to rent that Elantra, where with her vehicle she actually gets $60.34 in her pocket even after paying for the gas. But there's always this age-old question, are there other expenses? And the answer is yes. When you're driving your own vehicle, you are, you know, you have your insurance. Um, just the fact that you pay for insurance every month. Um, you have your wear and tear. That's the biggest thing with this, is you have wear and tear that you're putting on your vehicle, plus mileage. Uh, and if anything happens, if you get in an accident or anything, you're going to have to put a claim on your insurance. But sometimes that's the case also with a rental. Um, a lot of times when people rent a vehicle, they'll use their own insurance rather than paying for the expensive um, vehicle uh, rental insurance. So maybe this rental has the insurance in it. I'm not sure. But uh, if you get in an accident with your vehicle, that would be a claim under your insurance. And if you tell them that, that you're driving for work, sometimes that uh, affects your insurance also. Um, you also have things like uh, the fact that you're, and this is kind of part of wear and tear, but you're um, wearing on your tires, you're um, pushing yourself closer to your next oil change, um, you're pushing yourself closer to any sort of vehicle repairs that might be coming up. The more miles you put on, the closer you get to those things happening. So those are some of those other expenses or issues that might impact. And then one that always comes up in class, or not always, but often comes up in class, is how reliable is her vehicle? Um, is her vehicle in good shape? Does she is, have any concerns that her vehicle might um, break down or have problems um, if she uh, goes on this trip? Um, and also maybe the size. Uh, they don't say so, but um, does she have to transport anything? Um, does she have any other people going with her? Those types of things. So there could be some other expenses or issues um, in that decision. So now we're going to continue our discussion about Jenna and her cost of driving. Um, the problem with her taking her own car or renting a car. And what they want us to look at now is uh, the, what they call the true cost of driving the forerunner using um, the following assumptions. Now before we do that, the things that we came up with um, on our own in the, in the last lesson, or I came up with since I have no one to talk to here, um, is are these five things. We have insurance, uh, which they have covered here. Um, they also include registration and taxes, which we didn't mention. Um, they talk about tires which would be considered under wear and tear, um, and repairs, which would also be considered under wear and tear. And then we talked about mileage. Um, does, it, does it bother her to put more mileage on her car? Uh, that typically will decrease the value when you have more miles on your car. Also, if it's a lease vehicle, um, sometimes you're limited in the, in the mileage, mileage that you can have when you return that lease vehicle at the end of the lease. And then you have uh, the oil and other regular maintenance that would be in wear and tear. Tires would be in wear and tear. And then repairs would be in wear and tear. So we, we covered a lot of what they have here. And then we also talked about, you know, are you worried about the vehicle being reliable or does it have the size that you need, whether it's people that you're carrying or things that you have to transport. Maybe you have things that you have to take with you um, for that work trip. So now we're going to go down here and calculate these additional costs that you don't include when you just think about gas. Because when you drive your vehicle, you're, it's not just costing you the gas. Um, you're, when you're putting those extra miles in that extra wear and tear, that's getting you closer to the next oil change or closer to the next um, set of new tires and all that. So we're going to calculate that now. So it says that Jenna spends 2000 a year on her insurance registration and taxes. And last year she drove 21,600 miles. So what we need to do is we can um, take the length of her trip and we can figure out what portion of the entire year that trip would be. So assuming she goes about the same number of miles, 150 miles out of a yearly average of 21,600 miles, 
would get us approximately, get this on the calculator, 150 divided by 21,600 gets us approximately 0 0.00, .00 six nine. There's a four after the nine, so it's six nine four four four. I think the four is repeat forever. So this is the portion of her yearly miles that she would be using. So that's less than one percent, because one percent would be here. So this is like point six nine percent. If I take that by the total cost, the two thousand dollars, I can get her cost for her insurance registration and taxes for that one hundred miles. So if I take that times 2,000, and no, I'm not going to do it by hand, but just using the space that I have, we get 13.8, and that's dollars, because this is $2,000, so we're saying 0.69% of $2,000, and that comes out to be $13.80. So it costs just under $14 estimated cost for insurance registration and taxes for that 150 miles. Now we're going to do that same process for the rest of these. So again, we're at 150 miles, and it says every 3,000 miles she gets an oil change. So what is 150 miles out of a 3,000 mile oil change? So 150 divided by 3,000 gets us 0 0.05. So it's 5% towards her next oil change. If I take that 5% and I take it times 40, you get $2. Uh, 5 times 4 would be 20, and then if we shift the decimals, and you can just do it on your calculator if you'd rather, but that comes out to be $2. Okay, so between the insurance re registration and taxes and the oil and regular maintenance, we're up to about $15.80 now. Um, next, we have the tires. Tires, you don't have to get... Um, it says she typically gets every 50,000 miles. Depends on the tires you get, but... That's a reasonable number, so we'll say 150 miles out of that 50,000 miles until the next set of new tires. And that comes out to be 0 0.003. So it's less than this number. And then 920 is less than we were spending on insurance, so we're going to get a number even less than 1380. So 0 0.003 times $920, and we have a cost of $2.76 for that trip towards the next set of tires. Now the repairs, we have to... So now we have the repairs, and that has to be um, estimated also because not every forerunner is going to have the same amount of repairs every certain number of miles. It's not as regular as even tire changes or oil changes. Uh, so we're going to have to estimate that based on some past information on forerunners. So they got information from Edmunds.com, and it said that a forerunner, 2009 forerunner, has about uh, five hundred and seventy-seven dollars every fifteen thousand miles. So, again, one hundred and fifty miles out of fifteen thousand miles comes out to be one percent. You can see it's got the same digits, um, except for this has more zeros. So one five zero and one five zero 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 gives us one percent if you take one fifty and divide it by fifteen thousand. So then we'll take that times the five hundred and seventy seven dollars that it says it takes, and that comes out to be um, five dollars and seventy seven cents. And then I got rid of this information, so we'll have to recalculate it 
uh, we were going 150 miles. And if you divide that by 22 miles per gallon, that gets you roughly 6.8 gallons that you need. So, and even gas mileage isn't perfect because you use more gas when you're in town than when you're driving on the highway. So this isn't perfect, but it's about 6.8 gallons. And if I take that 6.8 gallons and then it was $3.59 per gallon. I'm going to double check that with my materials here. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Yeah, $3.59 per gallon. Then um, you get approximately $24.41. So these are all the expenses for taking her own vehicle. But even if we add those up, and we're going to add up the $13.80 plus the $2 plus the $2.76 plus the $5.77 plus the $24.44, even with all of that, her total is about... I haven't made any errors. I get $48.74. So we're still looking at roughly about $50 versus the rental vehicle was $98.98 just to rent it. Then there was 15.3% tax on top of that. And then you still had to pay for the gas. It, although the gas was less, it was only about $11 less. So it ended up being, um, it was like 98 and then the 15%, it was like a, 113 plus 13 dollars in gas it was I want to say it was right around 125 126 dollars so we're still spending a lot less on the forerunner on using her own vehicle than we are on the rental so a couple more questions to finish up this lesson uh, it says which of the above expenses does Jenna have to pay regardless of mileage well honestly the insurance the um, taxes and the registration she has to pay whether or not she goes on that trip anyway the only thing that may be affected is sometimes if your insurance finds out that you're using your vehicle a lot for work they actually will raise your rates um, so if you report to your insurance or if they, your insurance finds out that you're that you're using your vehicle um, a lot for work um, that could raise your rates but as it stands if it's an occasional thing um, she doesn't have to pay actually any more for insurance or taxes or registration. And lastly, it says since Jenna's trips vary in length, it may be useful for her to compare the cost per mile for renting to the cost per mile for driving her own car. What are these rates and what do they depend on? Well, for this problem, the 150 miles, this is going to, I'm not going to calculate the um, cost per mile for renting because when you're renting, um, the 98.98 for a per day is not going to change depending on how many miles you go. Typically, um, now it used to be different, but typically now you get unlimited mileage when you rent a vehicle. So she can drive as far as she wants in that given day, and it's not going to cost anymore. The only thing that would make it go up is if she had another had additional days. So if she had to stay overnight or something like that, it might increase the cost. But they don't really tell us that in the information that they gave us. So we don't know if it's 98.98 a day, if it's 98.98 for a week. Um, I doubt that. Uh, but they don't tell us that. So it's hard for us to figure out the cost per mile on the rental. We could do it for 150 miles, but then it would change if we went any other miles. So, but we can do it for her vehicle because her vehicle these costs are all dependent on her mileage well except for the insurance but if we go ahead and include that and say you know you're kind of paying a portion of that insurance by um, or using a portion of that insurance by driving uh, we'll count that in so even if we count that in it is 4874 for 150 miles remember we're trying to figure out cost per mile. So we're going to put the cost on top, miles on the bottom. So 4874 divided by 150 miles comes out to be approximately 0 
325 or about 32.5 cents per mile. So that's much less than she's getting reimbursed. And that's really going to stay pretty stagnant as far as for her car. It's going to remain that 32.5 cents per mile unless she puts a lot more miles on her car in a year um, and it ends up costing uh, something additional somewhere else. They said reimbursement wise that she was going to get back 56.5 cents per mile. So she gets back quite a bit more per mile from her employer than she spends per mile. So finally we're going to finish up uh, all of Unit 12 with talking about what happens when you do different lengths of trips. So it says when Jenna took her 150 mile trip you calculated the driving the driving her own forerunner would be the least expensive route and actually give her some leftover money. Do you believe the forerunner will always be the best option? Why or why not? How could you check? What we're going to do is we're going to um, investigate the various trip lengths to figure out is it possible that maybe the rental at some point would be worth more or would be a cheaper option? And what factors would affect the cost of these two options? Well, for her forerunner, we said it stays a pretty um, same amount per mile, no matter how many miles she goes. But the rental, she can go more miles, and that does not increase the rental cost, but she's going to be saving more and more on her gas because this rental vehicle gets 40 miles per gallon and her vehicle only gets 22. So let's just investigate and look at some different some different amounts. We know at 150 this one is the her car is definitely better. So let's go up to a larger number. Say we were at 500 miles. So say her trip was going to be 500 miles. And let's actually go a little less than that. Let's not go to 500. We back that up and maybe just go to 300 miles or something like that. So let's try 300 miles. So for her vehicle, that should just double the cost. And we said that her cost was for the 150 miles was 48.74. So we could look at it two different ways. We could say 48.74 for 150 miles. And if we take that times two, we'll get the amount for 300 miles. And that would be, it's gonna be just under $100, $97.48. For 300 miles. So now let's go over to the rental vehicle. And again, we're going to assume we're not going any extra days. If we go extra days, then we sort of have to start all over because then we have to increase that rental cost, possibly even double it for a second day or whatnot. But if we stay with the same amount and this $114.12 to rent, and we go 40 miles per gallon, but we go 300 miles, so 300 miles divided by 40 miles per gallon gives us we need seven and a half gallons and I want to point one thing out I really don't even need to do this because I can see that the rental is still costing more so 300 miles we still have Jenna's is, is uh, cheaper but we'll go ahead and, and finish it out so 7.5 gallons times three dollars and fifty nine cents per gallon gets us twenty six dollars and ninety three cents if we round it's nine two five which would round to ninety three so the twenty six ninety three plus the rental that we computed the ninety eight ninety eight plus tax is one hundred fourteen dollars and twelve cents and if I add those together fix that a little bit we 
we're at $141.05. So how does that compare to before? Well, before we were at about 100, we were at uh, 48 here, and then about 125. So it was roughly $75 more to do the rental. And now the difference between 97 and 48, so before we were at 48.74. I don't have written down what the rental was um, before, but it was roughly around uh, it was 114 plus 13, it was like 127, roughly. And so before we had from 48 to 127, we were about $79, $80 apart from each other. Now if you look, we've closed that gap. From 97 to 141 is only about $44, $45, somewhere in that range. So we've gone from being nearly seven, you know, about $75 apart to being um, under $45 apart. So this is getting better compared to this than it was before. So adding more miles makes the rental more um, closer to being an option. So now let's go to our 500 miles that I talked about. Oh, and up here, by the way, the 97.48, we could have used the 32.50 per mile and I think that's what I'm going to use on this one since it's not truly doubling or anything since we don't have a true match here so I'm going to say 500 miles and I'm going to use that 32 and a half cents per mile that we calculated in the previous lesson and you could do this other ways you could you know kind of start over and redo it but if I use this per mile I get hundred and sixty two dollars and fifty cents if I go over here to the rental, I have to again figure out how many miles I need or how many gallons I need to figure out the cost and then I'm going to add in my rental. So 500 miles divided by 40 miles per gallon means we need about 12 and a half gallons for this trip. Um, when you divide this, this actually comes out to be exactly 12 and a half gallons. When I say approximately, I'm just saying that that's not a perfect calculation because the miles per gallon doesn't stay the same all the time. So if I do that, then 1250 times the 359 for gas comes up to be $44.88. If I add that to the rental, I have a total cost of one hundred and fifty eight dollars and ninety actually it's try that again it'd be actually one hundred and fifty nine dollars so at this point this is very very close to the break-even point as we get bigger and bigger this vehicle starts to look more more like an option compared to this vehicle and this 500 mark is actually very very close they're only about three dollars away and remember this is all a little bit of an estimate anyway so they're actually you could say they're almost identical at this point so after that we should be saving money with the rental so say we go to 600 miles that would be again 32.5 uh, cents per gallon or $0.325 per gallon, and that's going to come up as $195. And this is including everything, the wear and tear and all of that type of thing. Over here, if I go to 600 miles, I'm going to do that same calculation, 600 divided by 40, because that's how many miles per gallon we get, and it looks like we would need 15 gallons. So 15 gallons times $3.59 per gallon we have a total in gas of $53.85. Add that to the rental and we get a total at 
600 miles for the rental of, I'm going to add 114.12, and that comes up to be $167.97. So just add $168. So now at 500 we were about break even. After that, this rental car ends up being a cheaper option versus putting all the wear and tear on your vehicle. Here's the problem though. 600 miles, if you divide that by even being able to go 60 miles an hour on average, yes, you can go faster on the highway than 60 miles an hour, but then you also have times where you have to slow down, stop, be in town, that type of thing. So say we could go 60 miles an hour, that's a 10 hour trip. Is that a one day trip? If you're going to drive someplace, work, and then return home. So I'm going to put here that that's maybe about 10 hours worth of driving. Is that one day rental? Or is that something that you're going to have to drive, spend the night, and come back? And thus, are you going to double your rental cost? Are you going to have your rental cost go to $98.98 per day? From renting cars, I will tell you that $98.98 a day is really high. So I'm not quite sure where they came up with that amount. I don't know if that was an amount that they found when they did some research, if it was just a random amount, but you can usually find a rental car for more around $40 a day, sometimes even less, sometimes not, sometimes a little more, but sometimes you can get less than that. So if you add all your costs in, um, but if you add all your costs in and if you did have to rent that vehicle for two days, then that of course is going to throw everything off because you're going to have to have $128.24 to rent it. And that's going to shift everything around again. So the biggest thing with these lessons is when you are dealing with your, your money, when you're spending your money, don't make assumptions. Don't listen to someone who says, oh, I always rent a car because it's cheaper. Um, don't say, oh, it, listen to someone who says, oh, I just pay for somebody to come fertilize and seed my yard because it's just easier and it doesn't really cost that much more. When you are attempting to do something, when you're, you're spending your money on something, whether it is renting, a, uh, renting an apartment, uh, deciding what cable company to use, what electric company to use, what vehicle to purchase, what vehicle to drive, all of those things, if you can do the mathematics on it, you can, as a consumer, figure out which of those is the best option for you, which is going to save you um, the most money or cost you the least money based on what type of effort you want to put forward. Like we were talking about with the concrete patio. Yes, they would save time by doing the concrete patio themselves, but then they have to do, do it themselves. Fertilizing the yard, they can pay someone and they can do it themselves. So you always have to balance that between doing it yourself and, and paying somebody to do it. But you want to be able to make an informed decision and, and make that decision based on the facts, not just based on a guess or a hunch. So that's the end of Lesson 12, and I will be back, of course, with Unit 13.